This video focuses on the Montgomery bus boycotts of 1955 and 1956. It's often described as the start of the civil rights movement, but that's misleading. The boycott itself has its roots in ground-level black activism and two well-established black organisations, the NAACP and the church, and this goes back a number of years. And also Rosa Parks herself doesn't suddenly appear as a civil rights heroine on, in December 1955 either. Parks was born in Alabama in 1913. She's of mixed race descent. In 1931, at the age of 18, she'd met Raymond Parks and they were married. He encouraged her to go back to high school and graduate. That's quite rare for Montgomery blacks and even rarer for black women. Both Raymond and Rosa were heavily involved in the civil rights struggle. Um, Raymond helped to set up the Montgomery branch of the NAACP and he sold their newspaper, The Crisis, in his barbershop, which he worked on and owned and ran on a desegregated military base. Rosa joined the NAACP in 1942 and worked closely with E.D. Nixon of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Despite failing the literacy test in 1943, she later passed it in 1945 and had the right to vote. In 1943, she also clashed for the first time with Montgomery bus driver James Blake. She tried to board his bus from the front. Blacks were expected to board at the back of the bus and then walk to the driver at the front to pay. She deliberately got on at the front. He ordered her off the bus and she vowed never to get on his bus again and almost never did. She'd been on NAACP leadership training courses and was ready for active protest. She said herself, every day in the early 1950s we were looking for ways to challenge Jim Crow laws. And while she might not have premeditated what she did that day, it was certainly in her thinking regularly that she was looking for an opportunity. And by 1955 she was the Montgomery NAACP branch secretary. The black community and the NAACP were already angry at the Montgomery Bus Company and looked at it as a potential target for their protest. In March 1955, the NAACP had considered championing the case of Claudette Colvin. She'd been arrested in March 1955 for refusing to give up her seat to a white passenger. Almost identical situation to Rosa Parks. However, she was a pregnant, unmarried teenager. She also had previously been accused of assault. And the NAACP felt she was not going to be a good person to put up on a national stage. The white press would rip her apart as a, as a bad role model, as a troublemaker. And any legal case would cost probably half a million dollars. And the, the case that they do take up... Um, um, costs that. So they were looking for a more respectable case and Rosa Parks fitted that. The black community were already angry too. In October 1955, just weeks before the Rosa Parks incident, uh, a black mother had boarded a Montgomery bus with, with two babies in her arms. And quite naturally, she'd placed her babies on the front seat, the white seats, so she could actually have her hands free to look in her bag to get her fare. And the bus driver yelled at her, take the dead, dirty black brats off the seats. And then without doing anything, he hit the accelerator and the bus started to move up and both the babies fell into the aisle. Fortunately, they were not seriously hurt, but incidents like this would have inevitably spread around Montgomery's black community. And on that fateful day of the 1st of December 1955, when Rosa Parks got on that bus, she would have been aware of all of this. When she got on the bus that afternoon, she didn't realise until it was too late that the driver was James Blake. She hadn't noticed him. Uh, she was on her way home from her job as a seamstress at a department store. The bus soon filled up and a white man was left standing. Blake ordered Rosa Parks and four other blacks to move to allow this man to sit down and also to clear the way for him because the city laws said that no black could sit parallel with a white passenger either. The other four moved but Parks refused. She was arrested and charged with a violation of the Montgomery City bus segregation laws. Following her arrest, the NAACP and the Alabama State College, which was a black college, helped her. 
They were encouraged by one of the lecturers there, one called Joe Ann Robinson, and by the Women's Political Council, which is a group of lecturers at the college. They copied and distributed propaganda letters to gain support and whip up support amongst the black community. The NAACP worked with local church leaders. They believed that church involvement would increase black working class participation and also keep some level of control on the movement and lower the likelihood of violence and disorder. The church would be crucial in this campaign. They would provide the organisation, the location, the inspiration for the campaign, as well as helping get some financial aid. One of the church leaders they approached was the 26-year-old Baptist minister who had recently arrived in Montgomery, Dr Martin Luther King Jr. Rosa Parks had already been to his church. She was quite impressed by his personality and charisma. He allowed his church to be used as a meeting place to plan a bus boycott to protest the Parks' arrest. And boycotts were traditional. They'd been used before and have been proven to be an effective mass weapon of protest. Adam Clayton Powell had used one in Harlem and been very successful in 1941. And in March 1953, blacks in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in the South, had used it to end segregation on their buses. The black community successfully boycotted Montgomery's buses on the day of Rosa Parks' trial. They demanded the bus company use a, a first-come, fair-serve system, that drivers be polite to blacks, and that black drivers be employed. Initially, they weren't demanding an anti-segregation. It was only when the city commissioners rejected those proposals that the one-day boycott became a year-long one. The community quickly agreed that Martin Luther King should be the leader of the boycott. In many ways, he's the obvious choice and, and something of a compromise choice. Um, the NAACP didn't really want to get involved themselves. Boycotts weren't part of their policy. They were concentrating on a legal campaign. And the Alabama State College, anyone working for them risked being sacked if they took a big role in this. As, as, a, as a Baptist minister, King has the freedom to act as he wishes to do. And he took charge of the new organisation, the Montgomery Improvements Association, which really is an umbrella organisation to encompass all parts of the protest. To organise getting blacks to work and around the city, the boycotters organised a system of carpools, with car owners volunteering their vehicles or driving people around themselves. We know that some white housewives also drove their black domestic servants to work sometimes dropping them at the end of streets where nobody could see them, but still playing an important role. Black taxi drivers charged black customers 10 cents a ride. That's the same fare as the bus. Uh, when city officials heard of this, they passed a law promising to fine any driver who charged less than 45 cents. So <laughs> passing laws telling drivers to put their prices up. It's crazy, doesn't it? Uh, people used any method to get around. They cycled, they walked, they rode mules, they drove horse-drawn buggies. Black churches across America raised money to support the boycott, and in particular collect new or slightly used shoes to replace the tattered footwear of Montgomery's blacks who tended to walk just about everywhere. Georgia Gilmore was a, a black resident of Montgomery who said, well, what we could do best was cook. And she began with a group of her friends to make sandwiches to sell at MIA meetings to raise funds. And this is so successful that the group grew and began producing entire meals to sell. See, obviously, if the black community are working everywhere, they've got less time. I mean, the bus was quicker than walking, so they haven't always got the time to shop or to cook food. And if somebody's actually going to make food for them and sell it to them, it's, it's a great idea. Um, Gilmore called the group the Club From Nowhere to protect the anonymity of its members and its contributors, some of whom were white. And they raised hundreds of dollars a week selling meals out of beauty parlours, laundrettes, barbershops, any location used by protesters. And it's this type of grassroots organisation that kept the boycott running for so long. It was opposed by the Montgomery White Citizens Council, who organised the opposition, and its membership rose from 6,000 in February 1956 to 12,000 by March. And it was dominated by leading city officials who ordered the harassment of blacks, in particular Martin Luther King. 
He was arrested for driving at 30 miles an hour in a 25 miles an hour zone. His house was bombed and firebombed. Along with other leaders of the boycott, he was arrested and convicted of interfering with a business. He was ordered to pay a $500 fine or serve 386 days in jail. He opted to go to jail. They let him out after two weeks because it backfired. It just All that had done was bring more national attention to the case in support of the blacks. And King plays a crucial role. I mean, his speeches are, are inspirational and he even appeal to some whites. And it does help to change some people's perceptions of black men. He stressed the boycott was non-violent protest, but it wasn't passive resistance. He called it active non-violent resistance to evil. The NAACP, in parallel, brought a legal case against the bus company called Browder v. Gale. And on the 4th of June 1956, the Federal District Court ruled that the bus company's rules were unconstitutional. The bus company appealed, but on November 13th, 1956, the Supreme Court upheld the decision and ordered the bus company to desegregate the buses. The boycott officially ended on the 20th of December 1956, after 381 days. The Ku Klux Klan responded by sending 40 carloads of robed and hooded members through Montgomery's black neighbourhoods. Instead of hiding inside in fear, blacks came out onto the streets and waved. Let's see how times have changed. If we look at the reasons for the success and, and the significance of Montgomery, there are lots of them. And bus boycotts weren't new, but they'd never been as one as long and well organised as this. It was a result of black organisations working together, so the NAACP and the church, and those links have been developed over several years. It demonstrated the power of a whole black community using direct but non-violent action. The fact that a black community could organise something this big and sustain it for so long surprised many whites. It would impress them, it would challenge perceptions of blacks and inspire other black communities. It showed the importance and potential of black economic power. Black shoppers couldn't get into the heart of Montgomery. Local businesses lost, in total, a combined $1 million. And a key factor in the white councils, in the white city council backing down was that businessmen, white businessmen, were working against segregation, saying, look, it's ruining our businesses. White extremism and violence with the Citizens Council and the Ku Klux Klan frequently helped to increase black unity and their determination, and it also offended and alienated moderate whites. It demonstrated the importance of the church and the organisation of protests, and it showed the continuing effectiveness of the NAACP strategy of working through the law courts. Whilst the boycott was important, it ran alongside the NAACP legal case of Barrow Gale. It inspired white support, it led to similar bus boycotts in 20 southern cities, and it brought Martin Luther King to the forefront of the movement as a national symbol. In 1957, he set up the Southern League Christian Leadership Conference. In some ways, however, the bus boycott's a limited victory. Apart from the buses, Montgomery remained a strictly segregated city. Even more, the black success galvanised many whites. They now felt their traditional way of life was under threat, and this made them more determined to fight and resist change. And what of Rosa? Rosa Parks, where it all started. She was sacked from her job in a department store. Her husband, Raymond, had to close the barbershop at the military base because any discussion of the boycott was banned and a sacking offence. The park's white landlord raised their rent. And sadly, eventually, they left Montgomery and moved to Detroit in the north. Rosa continued to, to campaign for civil rights and admitted that she had great admiration for Malcolm X. In 1975, Montgomery city officials invited her to come back to the town to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the boycott. And when Nelson Mandela visited Detroit in 1990, he only wanted to see Rosa Parks. When she died on the 24th of October 2005, aged 92, city officials in Montgomery declared that the front seats of all of their buses would be reserved with black ribbons in her honour until her funeral eight days later. And in 2013, on the 100th anniversary of her birth, President Barack Obama declared that that day would be Rosa Parks Day. Thank you very much. <laughs>